morning. Uh, I'm Lisa Green. I run a nonprofit called Common Crawl, which builds and maintains an open data repository. Do we have my slides? So I'm really excited to be here and spend the next two days discussing exciting and stimulating ideas with everyone here. And I'm very happy to be introducing the topic of the panel, what does the data world mean to society? I've prepared some slides. I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes. And then afterward, we'll discuss these ideas that I've introduced and many more with the panel and the audience. So we're on the cusp of entering the data world. It's nascent. It's just being born. But we're about to enter the data world. And this transition from the world we grew up in to the data world is no less profound than the transition between oral traditions and human writing. The data world is a totally new world with tremendous power to improve society. So what do I mean when I say data? We've had data for a long time. This is a picture of the Doomsday Book. Almost a thousand years ago, William of England collected census data right down to the number of livestock each villager owned. And by the 18th century, we had systemized, regular collection of census data and other types of data. By the early 20th century, we had even automated the distribution of some types of data. In the case of this image, financial data. Later in the 20th century, we had more common and more powerful computers. And we soon got to a point where we had, computers were very common, and we were able to easily store and manipulate megabytes of data. But this wasn't enough to give birth to the data world. Megabytes of data, handwritten ledgers, we needed something more. What we needed was massive storage capacities and very powerful compute abilities at a relatively low cost. We also needed digital connectivity that allowed us to share and link this data almost instantaneously at a very low cost, the mature internet. So we have those things now, right? We have massive storage capabilities, we have powerful compute, reasonable prices, and we have a mature internet. So as I say, this is the birth of the data world. And let me say again that the transition from the world we grew up in to the data world will have profound effects on society. Why? What's so different about the world we grew up in versus the data world? I'd like to talk about three properties of data that I think illustrate why data will have such an impact on society. And when I say data, I don't mean handwritten ledgers. I don't mean megabytes of data on a disk. I mean capital D data, the kind of data that we've all gathered here to discuss over the next couple of days. So the first property is that it's non-diminishing. Unlike land, food, gold, sharing data does not diminish the value of data. If I have 10 kilos of gold and I give you 5 kilos of gold, we both have 5 kilos of gold. But if I have 10 terabytes of data and I give you 10 terabytes of data, we both have 10 terabytes of data. In fact, I could give it to countless number of people. We all have 10 terabytes of data. Better yet, the people that you share it with are likely to discover new information, new data, and now we have more than 10 terabytes of data. So this non-diminishing property makes the data economy substantially different than previous resource economies. Let's look at an example of how this affects society. Let's talk about traffic. Cities have traffic. There's this an infrastructure problem. In the, de in the world we grew up in, the way to solve this was to throw physical resources at it, to throw money at it. Maybe you built new roads. Maybe you built or increased your mass transit system. And to do so, you needed physical resources and money. And those things were finite. If the city of San Francisco had a traffic problem and the city of Los Angeles had a traffic problem, the state of California has limited resources they could divide in this. One of the cities would not get the full amount of resources available. But in the data world, we can come up with a data-driven solution. We can analyze traffic problems. And I think Christopher would know much better about the types of algorithms that could solve this, but we can analyze traffic problems on a level that 
was inconceivable 10 years ago, and we can come up with some data-driven solution. Maybe it's re-timing the lights of the traffic signals. Maybe it's rerouting arterial ways. Maybe it's rescheduling mass transit, but it's a data-driven solution. And once the solution is found, not both San Francisco and Los Angeles get to benefit from this. They get the full impact of the resource. Any city in the world can take the data that led to that solution and the solution itself. There's no need to divide. Resource is less limited. There's an organization in the United States called Code for America, and they're doing things just like this. They build web applications for cities, many of them data-driven. Not all of them, but many of them data-driven. So they build open source, open data applications for civic governments. If the city of Boston needs an application that analyzes bus data and produces a better routing and notification system for buses, any city in the world can take that data and that software and share from it. So in the data world, resources are not necessarily limited, allowing benefits and progress to be more widely disseminated. Everyone can benefit from something in the data economy, much more so than in a resource economy. Second property I'd like to discuss is that it's quantifiable, it's analyzable. And yes, we've had data analysis for a while, but again, we've had census data for a while. I'm talking about big data. I'm talking about linked data. I'm talking about the data analysis of the data world, which is significantly different than the data analysis of the world we grew up in. This is real data based on actual human facts. It's not on symbol average, and there's a massive number of data points. The analogy of data analysis in the world we grew up in versus data analysis in the wor data world is, is it's analogous to, say, medieval medicine based on astrology and modern medicine based on mo uh, biomedical science. I'm sure you... I'm sure you've all heard of Google flu trends. Google uses their search data to predict the spread of flu, and they do so better than the U.S. government Center for Disease Control, which uses survey information and old-fashioned epidemiology. Using search data, Google can come up with more accurate, closer to real-time prediction of flu trends. Another group that's doing similar work, it was started by Dr. Adam Sandlick out of the University of Rochester. And his academic work predicted the real-time spread of flu in New York City using nothing but Twitter data. So he took that and he built that into a startup called Fountain. This kind of predictive modeling could have tremendous benefit to society. Just last year in the UK, there was a flu shortage, a vaccine of, uh, a shortage of flu vaccines in many areas of the UK. Swine flu spread more rapidly than was predicted, more rapidly than in the EU, and many areas in the UK ran out of flu vaccine. If they had been using work like Dr. Sandlick done, did, they would have been able to predict the spread, spread of the flu and to detect the public sentiment of the fear that drove the demand that led to an increased run on the vaccine with ample time to redistribute the supplies within the UK and import supplies from the EU to the UK. Before we continue, I'd like to take a quick aside to illustrate why I say we're just seeing the birth of the data world and that we're just entering it now. This article is by The Guardian. The Guardian talks a lot about data journalism. And, and I do believe that they're at the forefront of data journalism. But here's their data response to the flu vaccine shortage. Note that this was posted in Feb February 4th, 2011. And at the bottom, you can see it reflects data up until January 2nd, 2011. This is a month old pretty picture. Da I'm all for data visualization, but this is nothing like the predictive modeling the real-time predictive modeling that we have the capacity to do now. So I think this is a good illustration that we're just getting started in using the full potential of the data world. I'd also like to say that I use this example of flu trends and vaccines and talking about human health. That's a clear benefit to society if we can improve human health. But vaccines are a commodity, just like any other commodity. And this type of predictive modeling done in Google flu trends, done by Dr. Sandlick, 
is also applicable to commercial markets. In the words of Dr. Sandlick, the fine-grained epidemiological models we show here are just one instance of a general class of problems that our system solves. Other domains include, oh, sorry, other domains include understanding of public sentiment around your company or product, diffusion of information through a population, and predicting customer behavior. So these tools of the data world have tremendous implications for economic markets as well. How many people recognize these bottles for Net Blanca? No one, really? All right, good, good. So this is an Italian liqueur, and I can assure you that if you ask that question in the United States, very few hands would go up. It's not well known, except in the city of San Francisco. San Francisco consumes 25% of all Fernet imported into the United States. One city, 25% of the national imports. This fact was discovered by a reporter for the Atlantic Monthly, Monthly as an unusual and therefore interesting fact on a story in Fernet. But I have to wonder, how was Fernet thinking about this back in 2005 when the reporter gave, reported this statistic? Did they really understand the factors that led to this exceptional popularity in San Francisco? I mean, I'm sure they had business analysis. I'm sure they knew where their product was going. But did they understand it to the detail? All of the factors that went into this exceptional popularity, good enough to replicate it? I think the answer is no, or we would have seen a huge spike in the popularity of Fernet. I think they should hire a data scientist like Dr. Sandlick to be looking at their consumer behavior. And then they can hire uh, Nugget to implement those strategies. So in the data world, supply and demand can be more quantitatively understood and predicted, allowing us to better be, meet basic human needs and to optimize consumer markets. The third property I'd like to discuss is the fact that data is easily distributed. And this goes back to its non-physical nature. Just like when I said that land and food and gold diminishes when divide, shared, but data does not, land and food, well, food and gold <laughs> cost a tremendous amount of money and time to transport, whereas data can be transported, shared, duplicated with the click of a button. Here's a picture of Watson and Crick and their breakthrough in genetics, the model of the DNA. I come from a science background, and the improvement in the sharing and collaboration around data in the world of science is a very visceral and passionate thing for me. So take a look at this picture. This is a physical model that they constructed that lives in their lab, and this is how they're sharing their research, their data, with the scientific community. So yeah, they had publications, they wrote it down, then they mailed those publications by postal mail. But if you wanted to see their data, you traveled to their lab and looked at a physical model. In the background, you may not be able to see, but there's a hand drawing of their structure. Here's a genetics lab today. It's not unusual. This is a very common thing for a genetics lab to have. Note that you can download their data with a click. You can read the PDFs without waiting for your monthly magazine to come in the mail. And of course, you can email them if you want to discuss this instead of handwriting or typing a letter and dropping it in the postal surface. <coughs> so in the data world, information and knowledge can be rapidly shared around the globe at practically no cost. I'd like to give one more example that touches on all three of these properties of data and I believe is a very important example, and that's government. So many parts of the world, we have what we call a representational government. But do the representatives truly reflect the will of the people? Do they even know the will of the people? They have phone polls, they have in-person meetings with small groups of constituents. This type of data is vague and imprecise at best. But data, Real data, big data, data of the data world can reveal the will of the people 
to the representatives in the same way that it can reveal customer behavior and desires to consumer businesses. Another problem of representational government is, do they even care about the will of the people? In the United States, we have a big problem in that we think no. <laughs> it seems that the, oh, what the representatives are interested in is the money, the big money special interest groups, and that's all they're listening to. And we don't know what's going on in Washington, D.C. Who knows what's going on in Brussels? We don't really understand the voting. And Stefan touched on this in his opening address. So data can increase transparency in government. And we're seeing initiatives about open government and open data in government around the world. This is creating more informed citizens, more participatory government. There are also organizations like this group in the US called MapLight, and they collect voting data and donation data. And they map it together, and they disseminate it widely, and they show, here's your representative. They voted on this issue this way for the last few years. Suddenly they had a new donor. Their vote changed. So this grants citizens a greater insight into what's going on in our government, a more transparent government. In the data world, governments can be more transparent, allowing citizens to be better informed and more participatory. So before I wrap up, I'd like to make one more point that's my personal philosophy, though I think many of you here might agree with me, and that's that data needs to be open. Not all data, and we're going to discuss privacy later this afternoon, but what good is it if you can share data without diminishing its value if no one's sharing? What good is it if you can analyze large qualities, quantities of data if we don't have access to large quantities of data? What good is it if you can distribute data at the click of a button if it remains in a silo, locked on someone's hard drive, not distributed at all? So I believe that greater access to data, more open data, will allow us to see the full potential of the data world more quickly. Will allow us to really enter the mature data world and reap these benefits for society. So just to summarize a few of the societal benefits that I went over, and this is a non-exhaustive list. In the data world, resources can be less limited. Markets can be stabilized and optimized. Information transfer and research collaboration can be fast and cheap and we can have more transparent government. I'm really looking forward to discussing this with the panel and with the audience. And thank you very much for having me.